Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome back. Uh, sl sl slight change our subject in the sense that today we were going to talk about solutions, but I th thought yesterday before we do that, we should deepen a little bit our understanding of sustainability notions. So we'll do that then we'll start on solutions on next, next week. Um, so before we start looking, looking at alternatives and so on, let, let's think about another number of factors I think are important for our discussion. Okay. Uh, the, you could go too far with this idea, but there are people who argue that there are really no such thing as natural disasters. Right? That if you trace the origin of most disasters, they actually have their roots in, in something else. For example, climate change. Right, so these disastrous fires in Australia over the last few weeks, right, only just seem to have been put out by floods. Right now they have too much rain. Right, um, you know there are human factors, including where people live, where they build. You know factors like this as well, of course. But the, the extensive drought in Australia is really presumably a climate change related phenomenon. Okay, so I mean, in that sense, the disaster is is natural in one sense, but yet, if you trace the origins of climate change, right, it takes you back to arguments about, you know, our responsibility ultimately for creating this, right? Um, bad building practices. That's why we're going to talk about architecture a little bit more. You know, building in ways which are not sustainable uh, in relation to earthquake or seismic activity, extreme weather, uh, depending where you live. In South, parts of Southeast Asia, for example, it's not earthquake prone. It tends to be uh, typhoon, cyclones, okay? And a lot of housing is not really built to withstand extreme winds, okay? Uh, or rain or whatever, um, you know, building in vulnerable locations. You see that a lot in Japan, people living on hillsides, right? The bottom of steep slopes. And in fact, almost always when there's a typhoon in Japan, the, the majority of, of, of uh, deaths of fatalities tend to be from landslide, right? Not from, I mean, you don't get blown away, right? I mean, it's usually because of, uh, you know, the hill behind your house slipping down. And that seems to happen on a regular basis, okay? If you don't live in that kind of place or if the hill behind you can, in fact, be reinforced in fairly accurate, you know, efficient ways, then the, the levels of safety would be much, much higher, right? Um, building in floodplain, areas of floodplains. Now, this is, this is something which is occurring in the UK. There have been two very bad storms in Europe in the last week following one another. You know, there was one that passed and then another one succeeded it. I was looking at the news yesterday, heavy flooding in a lot of places. South Wales, which is the kind of country on the western side of the UK, right, very, very badly flooded. And almost always when you see this kind of flooding, it's because people have built in floodplain areas. In other words, they've built in places that are liable to flooding, right? And either without with, with inadequate defenses or assuming that, you know, it won't be that bad again, you know, da, 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 right? or there are defenses, but they're not sufficient, this kind of stuff. OK, but it's pretty stupid in a way to build in a floodplain, right? Because you can tell from the natural history of the region that floodplains flood, right? That's why they call this, right? OK, OK. Um, Ignoring vital signs, um, extreme weather coming or um, rising sea level, whatever it happens to be appropriate in your case. Human attachment to place. That's very interesting. Uh, Indonesia is f another very volcanic country. And there was a case actually about 20 years ago now where there was an eruption, quite a major eruption of one of the volcanoes on the main island of Java, which is very densely populated, right? Uh, even when vital signs were clear that there, an eruption was extremely probable, the government forbid people from going to the mountain. There was people who lived on it or had farms on the slopes of the mountain were forbidden from going close to the mountain because of the danger. You know what people did? They still went. 
right? It was never policed very thoroughly. You know, they would go back constantly and say, well, my, my house was there, my farm is there, you know, I'm prepared to take the risk, even despite the signs showing that there's likely to be, there was, in fact, an eruption, okay? Um, but, you know, we're very, very stubborn species, right? You know, we often we do this kind of stuff. Uh, the, the attachment to place, poor siting of industries, and energy generating plants, as with the Fukushima power station, you know, combines a lot of these factors, right? Inadequate sea defenses, siting the emergency generators on the ocean side of the power station, all those things we talked about before, right? Uh, unwillingness to let natural features fulfill their environmental function. For example, uh, if you travel around Japan, I don't know if you've noticed this, if you haven't, then start noticing it when you travel. It's very rare to see a natural river. Almost all rivers have been canalized, concrete banks, okay? Now, there are, there are, there are other social and economic reasons for this, including um, expenditure of local government budgets, right? You know, about this time of the year, they, they, get, they start worrying because they have to spend their budget by the end of March, right? End of the financial year. And you can't carry money over, so you spend it on all sorts of probably unnecessary projects, right? The theory is, of course, that if you canalize rivers, you can control water flow more efficiently. And that's not actually true. Uh, you can to a certain extent, but on the other hand, the natural spillage, the natural flooding area of rivers is destroyed by that process, that the river is confined to a very narrow bed. It's not allowed its kind of natural movement, okay? Including flooding. If uh, When you pass over a, a non-canalized river here, you often notice that the river only occupies a small area of the total riverbed area. There's extensive areas of gravel, grass, and whatever between the water and the actual embankment. Okay, so I would argue that this kind of thing, you have to be very careful when you do this kind of thing, because what you do is you, you undertake a project which seems to be positive in terms of you know, improving water flow and this kind of stuff, perhaps preventing flooding, when in fact you actually cause the problem in the long run. Uh, because you haven't let natural features, you know, the, the reason the natural feature was there was because it's natural, right? The river figured out its its natural course, okay? Rivers are a good example, but it could be of other, other things, hillsides, slopes, and what, all right? Uh, negative intervention in features such as lakes and rivers. Um, when uh, five, about five years ago, city of Chennai in India, was devastated by heavy flooding, which was caused by a combination of heavy rain, high tide, so that water couldn't flow out into the sea, right, which it would do at low tide, unusually high tides, and the fact that almost all the natural rivers and lakes in the city had been filled in by developers, urban development. You know, a lake is kind of tempting, you fill it in, you can build on the surface, right? Okay. In fact, what had happened was that almost all natural flood control devices had been swept away by urbanization. You see this in a lot of places. Uh, city of Mumbai, also in India, right, even this last year had two or three major floods, okay? And basically for the same reason. There was nowhere for water to go. Everything had been built over. There were no remaining lakes. Almost all rivers had either disappeared or been canalized, or in some cases simply gone underground. You know, they've been built over, which meant the volume of water that could flow through that contained river was smaller than the natural river. There's nowhere for water to go except to follow the underground passages, right? And it didn't work when you had that, that combination, very unfortunate combination of at least three factors, say extreme rain, uh, high tides, very high tide, and the fact that there was nowhere for water to run off, right? Any city faces this to some extent because any built up area has limited absorption of natural rain, right? Of course, you know, if you have a good drainage system and the drains are kept clean, one of the problems in Mumbai seemed to be the fact that people use drains as trash places. You know, in some Indian cities, there's actually no trash collection. 
of people throw away their trash all over the place, right? Which creates other problems as well, of course, of, of, of pollution, right? Uh, disease control, things like this. But also if you throw away your trash into a canal, of course the canal fills up when it gets extreme rain, nowhere for the water to go, unless it f flushes out your trash, right? So something as simple as that, keeping the drains actually clean so that water could flow out in the event of unusually high levels of rainfall. Um, well, just systematic overdevelopment. Um, as you know, I live in India at the moment. One of the fastest growing cities in India is in South India, a city called Bangalore, which is a big center of the IT industry. In fact, there's a whole, I don't you find many in Kyoto. It, 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 Tokyo are quite a big Indian community, which were basically all IT engineers. It's one particular district, Edogawa-ku, in Tokyo. It's like little India. You know, the Indian restaurants, there's now a school, there's an Indian school, all sorts of stuff. People brought their families, okay. Bangalore is really the, the sort of center of the IT industry in, in India. Very rapidly expanding city, physically expanding. And there have been many cases where developers have built what are called speculative developers. You know, I have some capital, I build an apartment block, okay. Then I want to find people to live in it, obviously to buy or rent the apartments, okay. The problem with some of those apartments turned out to be there's no water. Okay, so you built a wonderful apartment. Obviously, nobody's going to live in it because there is no water except water that is brought in by tanker. You know, so some Indian cities, Chennai again, the, the city that was badly flooded about five years ago. It's, it's a regular sight in the streets of the city. You'll see water tankers, big trucks with water tanks on the back which are going around people buying water. You know, you, if your house will have a tank, you buy water from the water tanker and pump it into your house because you have either inadequate water supply from the, the regular city supply, or if there is water, Chennai is on the coast. And I remember staying at a guest house of one of the universities there. There were two taps in the bathroom, okay? One was for fresh water, the other water was basically saline. It was so salty that if you bathed or washed your hair, you then had to bathe, wash yourself again in fresh water. Otherwise, you know, if you've been swimming in the ocean, you come out, you feel slightly sticky because of the salt in the water that of course sticks to you, gets in your hair and everywhere. So this is very interesting. You know, you bathe once in the salt water and the second time you kind of wash yourself off to get the salt off because that water of course was undrinkable and could not be used for, even probably for agriculture at all, okay? Level of salinity, so very, very high. So I say a place like Bangalore, you have, you have this problem where people have built their empty apartment blocks because that there is simply no water supply. And most of us would not buy an apartment, I don't think, if it did not have an assured supply of regular water. Right? You have to buy it from a water tanker. This is not a, a nice idea. Underlying that is, is, of course, the fact that often we don't really have very good relationship, understanding of our relationship to nature. You know, we don't look, particularly if we're urbanized people. I remember once, actually I had a very sick experience. I was in New Zealand, a city called Wellington, okay? And my host, my host's father, my, my host was one of my fellow graduate students, okay? His father had just retired as the chief water engineer of the city. And he was a very interesting guy to drive around the city with because he keeps noticing things, saying, you know, right under here there's a pipeline, you know? Or you see that mountain, you know, you have to get water from the other side, you know? And so tunneling through there was really difficult. All sorts of things never occurred to you. Where does the water come from, <laughs> right? I guess, where does the water come from here? Lake Biwa? There is a canal, there is a, there is a, a canal linking to, to Biwa, right? Okay. But you know, being urban, urban creatures, a lot of the time we probably don't think much about natural features and how those might affect livability, you know, vulnerability, and all those kind of factors, okay? You might want to live by the sea because the view is nice despite the risks of flooding, storm, tsunami or whatever, okay? And the third thing, which we're gonna discuss in a little bit more detail now, is two very interesting ideas which help us think about sustainability and risk, 
which is the notion, are these familiar to you? Planetary boundaries? Have you heard these phrases? If not, we will talk about them now. You can, you can Google it, you will find the sources for this quite easily. And the notion we mentioned last class, which is the notion of the ecological footprint. Okay, they're two very useful tools for thinking about limits of sustainability. Okay, now if you want to look up the literature, the, the idea of planetary boundaries was prop popularized by this very famous paper by a whole lot of people, but the, the lead author is Johann Rockström, called Planetary Boundaries Exploring the Safe Operating Space for Humanity. I don't know if the journal is available here, it's in the journal called Ecology and Society. Okay. Um, and it's, it's a major source now that people have, it's one of the most cited papers in the world. It's been cited 6,200 times last time anybody checked, right? So any author is very happy to be cited 6,200 times. Everybody's reading your stuff, okay? So, okay, that's, that's the source if you want to pursue this. But if you Google it, uh, planetary boundaries. Now, the idea of the boundary is, of course, that you have a, a limit. And since we're on a finite planet, the very nature of the planet sets boundaries, right? Unless you're really into science fiction and you think you can get resources from other, you know, you've got mine something on Mars or whatever, okay. You know, we're stuck with one planet, okay? So the idea of planetary boundaries is basically the idea that we have a finite space. That finite space contains Obviously, as we know, limited resources. And except in science fiction, we don't have access to resources beyond the limits of, the, of, of this planet, the one, the one planet that we have, okay? So, and the authors of that paper identified nine boundaries, okay? There might actually be others, but we can, we can, we can talk about that ourselves. So again, if you look it up, you can find these quite quickly. CO2 concentration, which we are very well aware of, right? Although since they wrote the paper, people have become aware of, of course, other sources of global warming, including methane, which is a major... Are you aware of this? Meth methane is a more potent greenhouse gas than CO2, okay? And with global warming, areas of the world, such as Siberia, which contain lots of methane trapped in the soil, in the tundra, once they warm, the levels of methane release increase, right? Which promotes more global warming. <laughs> and you get more global warming, and you're gonna have more warming of the tundra and so on, you get higher release of methane, and you know, a very vicious cycle begins, okay? Which is gonna be very hard to stop. So it would be methane as well as CO2, and what is called radiative forcing. I don't know if that concept is, known to you either. The CO2 figures we hear about a lot, okay, which is basically the idea that it's thought that sustainable levels of CO2 in the atmosphere should be below 350 units parts per million, okay? Current levels are well above that. The highest level recorded so far was 414. It went down a bit. It's, it's, it's somewhere between 408, 410 at the moment, okay? So above sustainable levels, if you wanna maintain global temperatures at a habitable level. Radiative um, forcing means reflection of heat back into space, okay? In other words, the amount of heat that arrives on the Earth's surface per meter, how much is retained and how much is reflected, okay? And again, it is thought that currently the safe level is 1.5 watts. You know, watt is the usual member, measure of electricity, of electrical power per square meter. And current levels actually slightly exceed that now, 1.6, okay? Which means, of course, that the Earth's surface is warming that less heat is being reflected back. Again, if you're into, if you're into <sighs> science fiction, I think it's mostly science fiction, there is a whole debate about so-called geoengineering. Nobody's followed any of this, including the idea of putting up enormous mirrors all over the place so that incoming sunlight will be bounced back. 
So you reduce the radiative level, right? Or you see the atmosphere in such a way that it will be more reflective, and so sunlight won't penetrate to the same extent. Uh, there's a lot of debate about this because, of course, there are also, whether it's technically possible in many cases to do this, financially possible, whether it would work, and potential effects of this, okay? Uh, it was only done once. Uh, um, a North American millionaire, who had lots of spare money, tried an experiment of seeding the ocean in an area off the, in the Pacific, off the north coast of America, with particles of iron. And the idea was to, again, in, to, to affect, affect the quality of seawater in such a way that it was compatible with future sustainability. The problem is nobody knows what the effects of these kind of interventions would be. They're not natural, obviously. So, you know, the potential dangers of unleashing some kind of uh, negative effects are unknown. You know? You can say, well, if we try it, the trouble with experimenting with this is we're all going to be affected, right? If somebody changes the Earth's atmosphere, you know, it's not only they who are going to say, oh, this was great. The experiment didn't work, sorry, but because all of us are going to suffer, right, from any negative effects of somebody's geoengineering attempt. So they often talk about this, but um, it hasn't, except in extremely minor ways, actually happened, okay? Secondly, since the ocean is a major sink of CO2 and it's absorbing higher and higher levels, the acidity levels of the, of the oceans are rising. And this is, of course, having multiple effects on all sorts of things, right? Seafood. What percentage of the total world food sea... Ah, let me rephrase that. What percentage of the total fish catch in the world, global fish catch, is eaten in Japan. <laughs> Small lots. What's that, sushi? It's 10%. 10% of the total world fish catch is eaten here. Okay, the other 90% goes to everybody else. Okay, because obviously, you know, one of the joys of Japanese diet is that if you like fish, this is a great place to eat fish, right? Okay, very fish-based diet, less meat, but more fish. Obviously, acidification affects uh, life cycle of, of fish, right, and other aquatic organisms. And it's leading to things like one of the potentially huge ecological tragedies unfolding at the moment, also in Australia, not the fires, but something else. Anybody know what it is? One of the things a lot of people who visit Australia go to see. Helps if you can swim, as a clue. No? Off the northeast coast of Australia is the Great Barrier Reef, the largest natural coral reef in the world, okay? And it's basically dying. It's bleaching. So new coral is not being formed and the old coral is, is dying off. It's called bleaching because it actually turns white, okay? And the reason for this is basically acidification. And amongst the factors, not only rising CO2 levels, so the fact that Australian farmers who use chemical pesticides, these flow off into the sea. And of course, they, they are affecting the coastal waters of the country. And that is also contributing to die off of coral. Okay, but again, multiple effects, which we presumably don't understand on fish, crabs, aquatic plants, and any number, any number of things. Okay, that to say, with farmers particularly, this is also related to acidification, right? We just said, because uh, excessive uses of the, the natural nitrogen phosphorus cycle disrupted by the excessive use of chemical fertilizers. And of course, fertilizers go somewhere, right? I mean, they wash off, they, 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 they get into the sea, they get into rivers, they get into lakes, they get into all over the place, right? So uh, again, this, this has all sorts of effects, not only on the ocean, but in fact on any water body, because loss, loss of oxygen in water, obviously, is gonna kill fish, right? And you know what an algae bloom is? When 
water plants, certain kind of water plants begin to proliferate in huge quantities. They start to cover. During the Rio Olympics, nearly four years ago, there was a crisis at one point with one of the kind of boating lakes where they would have their rowing exercise because the whole lake started turning green. Right? And it turned out the reason for this was an algae bloom. The water had insufficient oxygen to maintain the, the natural uh, habitat of the plants in the, and fish in the, in the lake. Right? And the result was that algae, which use much less oxygen, could proliferate right? and become themselves a problem. Okay? Um, biodiversity loss, one of the big ones, of course. Uh, and as people have pointed out, this has multiple potential impacts. One was the example we used last time with the bee, right? You lose your bees, you lose a natural pollinator. So the effect of the bee disappearing on agriculture is potentially very big. Like you think of the bee as just a kind of tiny little creature, right? They, they turn out to have a big role. The earthworm you know, in the ground, aerating soil, right, and all this kind of stuff. So on the whole, we don't necessarily know what role any animal or plant fulfills in the total ecological system, okay? And sometimes they, it's pretty obvious if you work it out. Um, India, again, has seen a, a fairly systematic loss of its tiger population. And the reason the tiger population is declining is because tigers compete with humans. Uh, if you're a cattle farmer or sheep farmer, or goat farmer in India, tigers are really your enemy because tigers like to eat your cows, right? Okay. And one of the major loss of livestock is actually through predation by tigers or leopards. Okay. So you still find tigers and they're often in reserves of some kind. Okay. So you, you can find your tigers to a reserve or, you know, the number of tigers living in natural habitats declines, okay, because of competition with humans. The population of deer rises, okay, because the, the food, one of the major food sources of the tiger was, it's, you know, free to breed. You know, they're, they're not getting eaten by nearly the same quantity as they were when there were more tigers, right? What do a, what a deer do to the environment? Yeah. Deer are quite destructive. They're terribly cute, right? They appear in all sorts of comics in Japan and so on, right? They're big eyes and this kind of thing. But they're quite destructive of things of trees. If you're planting, if you have a new plantation of trees, young trees, you better fence it if you have deer or goats, for that matter, around, okay? Because the, the uh, deer love the small trees, the saplings, and they will eat the bark. And so the trees will die, not because, you know, because the, it, it's been stripped of its bark, it can't survive. Okay, so, you know, you, you, you lose your big predator, but then you have a rise of another kind of animal, which is not dangerous to humans, but competes indirectly by the damage they do to standing crops. Okay, so if you talk almost animal species and you trace the linkages, you might find surprising things happening, okay, that we don't fully understand. I mean, other aspects of biodiversity loss, of course, are, are very directly related to human well-being, such as medicinal loss of medicinal plants or the loss of animals which contain organs or whatever that are useful for human medicine, okay. So with the loss of medicinal plants, particularly with deforestation, Latin America, for example, we're losing a major source of uh, herbal medicine, okay? Uh, global freshwater use. Now, we were saying in class the other day, I, I think the current figure is, doesn't change much, right? But 71% of the Earth's surface is water, of which the majority, of course, are oceans, okay? And oceans are good for fish, but they're not much good for agriculture, for drinking water, for most human purposes, really freshwater bodies. Because with rising populations and with intensive use of water, uh, 
One of the potential resource conflicts of the near future is not oil, but will be water, particularly in arid areas like Middle East. You think of the Middle East as being an oil problem place, right? But in fact, water is likely to become just as serious a problem. Okay, use intensive agriculture. Go to a country like Israel, for example. They're very proud of the fact they've turned a lot of desert into green areas. But of course, where do you get the water from in a desert area? Aquifers, to some extent, low rainfall. Uh, and this is leading to disputes over rivers. One of the main, the only main river that runs through Israel, a famous, famous river biblically called the Jordan, right? And I mean, I felt, when I w once went to Israel, I would go and see the River Jordan, right? I imagined it was some huge river. It's this little thing, it's about as wide as this room. That's it? That's all? You know? And how much water can you extract from a, a single water source like this? which itself is fed by rather limited rainfall and springs and so on in the, in the mountains. So in an arid area particularly. Um, I mean, I used to, you can try this at home too, if you like, we have a long weekend coming. You probably won't, but I used to get my students to all sorts of strange things. One of them was, we did the waste thing. How much waste do you generate as an individual? And it's scary how much waste we generate as individuals. You know, how many of those little bags of recyclable, non-recyclable, burnable trash you put out in a week, okay? It was water usage, okay? If you flush the toilet, how much water do you use? How much do you estimate of? Depends on the thing, of course, but between probably between 10 and 15 liters. Okay, so say we were talking about the hotel in Delhi, remember the other day when the court stopped the development because the judge asked one very simple question How much water will this hotel use in relation to the available resources of water? And of course, it turned out far more than the natural supply could possibly. Uh, what we could possibly provide, okay? So, you know, <laughs> you can just occasionally do little things like this at home. Think, how much water do you use in a day, right? Where does it come from? Where does it go? All right? And if you start to measure it, most of us would probably use, how much would you use? You'd 30, 30, 50, 60, 100. If you take a shower, you fill your ofuro, right? <laughs> How much water in typical, oh, I know, you get, get banned, very scientific about this, you can reuse your water, right? In the West, basically, you just, after you had your bath, you pull the plug and let the water out here, you can reheat it. But even so, how much water would a typical or furrow contain? 40, 50 liters? Probably, yeah. I've never measured it, right? So you could just do a little calculation. I mean, actually, how much water do I use in a day? You know, just for ordinary purposes. Then if you add washing, washing up, you know, bathing, drinking water, cooking, and so on. Uh, you can see why with rising populations, uh, water becomes actually a very, not rare resource yet. It depends where you live. Of course, Japan is fairly well off with this. There's still snow in the mountains around here. It's going to melt, right? So we probably won't have a water shortage in the summer. Um, land use change. With more and more uh, agricultural, well, well, more and more agricultural land being converted into built-up areas, right? As I say, I, I went to, as you know, I went to Osaka on last Saturday, and between here and Osaka, it's totally built up. There's no countryside, right? You might see the occasional little field where someone's still growing cabbages or something, but you know why that is on the whole in Japanese cities, why you still see little tiny farms? It's to do with the land tax. If you have a piece of land in an urban area in Japan and you cultivate it, you pay land tax at rural rates. You pay agricultural land. If you just leave the land empty, you have to pay the urban rate, which is much higher, okay? So if I have a piece of land and I, I'm not doing anything with it, I'm not planning to build on it, just plant it with something. Say, no, it's a farm, right? Look, I have cabbages. If the tax inspector comes, say, look, no, I'm growing potatoes, right? So often that stuff is just wasted. It's just pulled up and thrown away and you plant again. 
mainly because you want to pay the lower tax rate. Okay, but basically there's no countryside, right? If you if you go in that direction, okay. So you've got two two things. One is increasing occupation of land for urban and industrial purposes. Okay, and by industry I would mean things like um, two things we don't think about too much: airfields. Kansai Airport is very clever idea, right? Build the thing on an island, right? Artificial island, so. It doesn't occupy land, and landings and takeoffs are over the sea, so there's no noise pollution for you know, residents in the, in the immediate area of the airfield. But airfields use a huge amount of land, right? So there's something else you don't think about very much, which are motorways, freeways. Because to most of us, they just appear to be a strip right, running through the countryside. You want to drive from here to Okayama or somewhere, you go all the way on freeway. I guess you can go all the way to Tokyo, right? On a, I have been all the way to Tokyo on the, on the bus, on the night bus, right? And you stay on the freeway all the time. So you think of it as just as a strip, but if you calculate the total area of that strip, right, multiply the length by the width over, say, 300, 400, 500 kilometers, you've used a lot of land. Right? You use a lot of land. You think of the Shinkansen lines, you think of motorways, regular roads, this kind of stuff. So on the one hand, you have land conversion. On the other hand, you have colonization of formerly natural land like wetlands for agricultural purposes. You drain wetlands because you can turn them into farm. Okay. The danger of draining wetlands, of course, is its effect, number one, on biodiversity birds particularly, but fish and other aquatic creatures that live in wet, wetlands lose their habitat, okay? And you frequently lose your flood, natural flood control space. Water that would have been absorbed by the wetland now has nowhere to go, all right? So you can see the linkage between these things. Um, atmospheric concentrations of pollutants, um, now, I hate to admit this, but I live, it's so nice being here, breathing fresh air. Delhi is currently the most polluted city in the world in terms of atmospheric pollution. So much so that you see people wearing masks. It's not because of the virus. It's because they're just trying to keep some of the pollutants out. Beijing used to be, at one point, considered the most. And when the Olympics were approaching, remember, there was a big campaign, right? Move industry out, do all sorts of things to clean the air before the Beijing Olympic. Okay? Uh, it's incredibly polluted uh, because of industry, construction, excessive traffic, and all sorts of things. So daily in the newspaper, I mean, it's rather scary when you actually live there. You will see the, the pollutant level. There's a kind of color code. If it's, if it's like white, it's very clear. It's never white. Then it's yellow is not bad. You know, something is orange is bad, but not impossible. Red is hazardous. And often in a week, you'll have four or five days when it's hazardous. And you get notices saying, don't jog, don't undertake vigorous exercise, don't go to the gym or something like this because you're, you know, breathing pollutant air, okay? Most cities have some level of this. Of course, Delhi happens to be particularly bad, okay? But most, I think most cities have quite high levels of atmospheric pollutants, okay? Traffic, again, generated by the same reasons, industry, traffic, and construction are the main ones, okay? Tertiary pollutants, meaning stuff in, not, not in the air, but in our food, in the water, in any number of places that you're getting stuff. Now, again, I forget the figure, unfortunately, but I can't remember it now. I, I, I saw recently the figure of the number of chemical substances loose in our environment, and it's huge. Some of them are, again, of industrial origin. Uh, some are from you know, wash out of atmospheric pollution. Some are additives of one kind or another. Now, again, we were talking about reading your bottle, remember the other day. I was in a Starbucks cafe one day somewhere, and I was a bit hungry, so with my coffee I wanted a sandwich. And stuck on the sandwich is a list of the things that it contains. Now, it's supposed to contain bread, 
chicken and butter. There were at least a dozen other, there were things, preservatives, there were colorants, there were things to extend the shelf life, you know, so the food would, would preserve longer, okay, without refrigeration. I can't remember how many things there were all in my sandwich. I'm eating a whole chemical laboratory here, right? All I wanted was a sandwich, okay? So again, you know, if you read, yes, I don't know, with, like, with, with tea or something else, it's probably less. With foods, there are often a high level of additives, some of which are not really identified. Sometimes you see on the packet, it will say you have this chemical, this chemical, this chemical, and permitted colorant. So keep it looking red or keep it looking green or whatever it's supposed to be. Well, what does that mean, permitted colorant? It's some chemical, obviously added to keep the color of my tomatoes or whatever looking really tomato-like <laughs> for longer, okay? But it's clearly, it's, it's a chemical. And obviously you're obviously ingesting this. Um, so, you know, the health, the health fat. And the one piece of good news, in the planetary boundaries, which is ozone depletion. Ozone depletion, actually, which was a serious problem in the 1970s, 1980s, has been reversed. There was, an, for once, an effective international meeting that, that led to uh, a treaty called the Montreal, Montreal in Canada, sitting in Canada, called the Montreal Protocol, which would ban the use of propellants in, um, what do you call them, spray cans? I think like the 1970s or 80s, everybody was in spray cans. You would spray bugs, there were, there were perfumes, you would you know, spray yourself, your hair, your, all this kind of stuff. Your refrigerator ran, it, it, it required um, the same kind of chemicals. And of course, when a refrigerator is decommissioned, broken up, all this stuff is released back into the atmosphere, right? Creating a larger and larger ozone hole, which has many effects, including promoting things like skin cancers. Right? There was a time in Australia, if you went to Australia, you were advised that you should wear a hat and long sleeve clothes. And if you wore like short sleeve clothes, then put on, yeah, repel, what, what, what do you call it? The, the, you know, the stuff to protect your skin from the, from. And you could buy one some incredible power. If you went to the drugstore, it would say, you know, power of 10, power of 15, power of 20, power of like 30. You better get the strongest one to spray on because otherwise you would probably get skin cancer uh, because of the huge hole. It was particularly in the southern hemisphere, Australia, Antarctica, very much affected. But unfortunately, that, that's actually been reversed. Now, I would think there are, there are probably other factors, too, you could add to our planetary boundaries. Whether you'd agree or whether you could think of even more, you would like to put on the list. Um, many people have argued that, because we talk about loss of biodiversity, loss of cultural diversity is also a quite serious problem. Because if cultures become more and more the same, more and more homogeneous, all sorts of knowledge is lost, all, all sorts of things disappear, with the disappearance of those, of those cultures, right? Any number of things. I mean, it can be things like, in fact, natural medicine, okay? Where in the past, people did not have such a big pharmaceutical, you know, set of drugs and interventions they could draw on. They were drawing stuff from natural sources. Your grandmother probably did this, you know, had all sorts of things. And often they're very effective. Okay, as they disappear, all that potential knowledge about human health disappears with that loss of cultural knowledge. Okay, um, language loss. Okay, uh, there isn't apart from just the sheer interest of languages, and languages are being the world is losing many languages, smaller communities, tribal languages. I read a very interesting article in a newspaper here, actually, a couple of years ago, that the last remaining speaker of one of the Amazonian Indian languages, his kids were not interested in learning. They'd moved to the town. You know, they were learning to speak Portuguese. It was in Brazil, right? Uh, he was the last remaining person who know, knew the language. So with his death, the language would vanish, except in, if somebody recorded it. But even then, there's no living speaker right? Nobody actually knows the language, okay? And Peter pointed out that one of the reasons, one, one, apart from the intrinsic 
sadness of losing a language is gone, never to return, is that languages embody knowledge. When the language disappears, the knowledge contained within that language disappears. There are many famous examples of this. I mean, one of the classic examples, or amongst the two or three classic examples, are uh, if you go to the Congo jungle, Central Africa, the pygmy people, the, the native people who live in the deep forest, have only about two or three names for colors. Because in the deep forest, you can try this out. You go into a very dark forest. You can't see color. You see gray, brown, green, maybe not much else. Bright colors disappear almost. You are very hard to see. There's no sunlight. Okay, But their botanical knowledge is huge. Okay, They can identify almost any plant, and they can tell you what it's useful for. Oh, this plant is good. If you have a headache, you, you should you know, make a soup out of this plant. If you have a stomach ache, try this one. If you have something else, try this one. If you have whatever, you need to rub this one on. This one you should drink. This one you should do something. And again, most of us have no knowledge of that kind. Would you agree? We have very, very limited knowledge, probably, of medicinal uses of plants in the environment. Okay. How many major crops constitute more than 90% of the world's population? What do we eat, in other words, and how many of those major plants are there? What do you eat? Rice. <laughs> right. Okay, so we have, well, what are they, right? Rice, wheat, barley, potatoes, carrots, cabbages, da, 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 da. I mean, I we could make a list. It turns out there are only really about 12 major plant species which are consumed by most of the world's population. In fact, there are thousands of edible plants out there. And of course, they vary, they vary with cultures, okay? I mean, like daikon is eaten here, but it's not eaten in India. Nobody has any idea. They don't grow there. You know, there's a little tiny radish about that big, but not these kind of gigantic daikon, right? So, you know, you find, of course, there are regional variations, but there's a very small number of basic food plants, right? People like the pygmies, although they have a very small color vocabulary, where well, we have a much bigger one, red, blues, greens, da, 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 hundreds of things, right? We have very limited knowledge of the botanical environment, unless you are a specialist in one of those things. Most of us are probably very ignorant about this, right? So when the language is lost, of course, that knowledge is lost with it. So what some people call indigenous knowledge, which can apply to many things, right? To uh, use of plants, how to grow things, uh, herbal medicine, methods of, of healing, any number of things, okay? When they vanish, they've, they've gone really from the world's body of total knowledge. And of course, people talk about mass consumption as being another factor because we consume so much, right? And one of the things I always notice whenever I come back to Japan, and if you've maybe noticed this too, is the wrapping culture. You go to a convenience store and you buy one bottle, tiny bottle of tea, they put it in a plastic bag. So you get the plastic bottle, and you get a plastic bag, which is about that big. I don't know what to do with the plastic bags. The bigger bags you can often recycle for your trash or something. You know, you can reuse in one sense. But a lot of these things are, you don't have to wrap up everything, right? If you go to Germany, always take your shopping bag with you because they won't give you one. You can buy one in emergency. I really forgot to bring a bag and I suddenly wanted something. You know, they will sell you it. But they give you these really dirty looks. You don't have a bag? You know, you're going to take a plastic bag, you know, what are you going to do with it? It's not biodegradable. You know, you think, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. You know, you feel really guilty. You created an ecological sin, <laughs> right? They make you feel like that. Always take your shopping bag with you, okay? Because they would expect it. So the planetary boundary idea is that given a finite, several things. Number one, given a finite planet, there are limits, okay? One other obvious thing that they did not put in their list, I think they were thinking of a slightly different approach to this, is, of course, resources, right? 
whether oil, water, coal, uh, rare earths, you know, uh, materials that you need. For example, there are, all sorts of, there are all sorts of things in your cell phone, your mobile phone, okay? Including uh, quite valuable minerals, which are used in very, very small quantities, right? And this itself is becoming a competitive question because there are not many places that have rare earths, you know, occurring naturally in their geology. China is one country that does, for example, China controls a lot of the rare earth market in the world. There are, there are other places that have it, but in smaller, in smaller quantities, okay? So competition over resources is, of course, likely to intensify as those resources run out and as populations increase. So demand increases. So you can, so you can probably add others. So again, resources and perhaps these other factors too. So it's, I think, quite an interesting way of looking at it. Now, the link with disasters is, of course, the idea that if you violate a lot of these boundaries, you're asking for trouble, right? You're doing exactly the wrong thing. You're encouraging, in fact, the very situation you want to avoid, all right? The other way of, uh, another way, not, that's not the only other way of looking at that, is in terms of the, the ecological footprint. So that notion, say, you can do this with a city, you can do it with a community, you can do it yourself to try to calculate, you know, how big is my ecological footprint? How much do I consume in terms of ecological resources, particularly ones that cannot be replaced? Now, in the, in the typical footprint model, and the, the, the um, reference to their website, the, the people who developed this idea is there. You can look it up, you know, if you want to calculate, more, more look at this in more detail. In, in this kind of calculation, assume that the, the sustainable footprint is measured as one. If my use of resources that I'm taking from the environment does not exceed one, then you have equilibrium, right? I'm taking things, things are going back, okay? So the total environment is sustainable, okay? Uh, so above that means you're eating into nature's reserves. And many of those reserves are not replaceable, right? Sunlight is, for example, that's why solar energy is a good idea. Right? Others are not. Oil is not. Coal is not. Right? These minerals are not. If you use them up, you use them up. You can't, you can't make any more. Okay. The current global footprint is calculated as being 1.8. Does that a scary thought? Human beings collectively are consuming almost twice the sustainable limit. All right? And it's probably rising because as countries like India, you know, develop, people will consume more, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna want more resources, they're gonna want more energy, they're gonna want more stuff, they're gonna want more cars, they're gonna want all this kind of stuff, that the footprint is likely to expand. Um, travel, you know, um, air travel is expanding rapidly all over the world where, where people, there's an airline, they fly, they fly here, it's called Air Asia. I don't know if I Air Asia, it's one of the dot-com airlines, they're quite cheap, no, no frills. And on the side of the planes, they red and white planes, it says, now everyone can fly. Which, democratically, is a nice idea. You know, it's not only the rich who can fly, because airfares are too high, you take your no frill, true, you don't have no frills, you don't get any luxury, but you get to the, where you want to go, right, okay? Uh, uh, is it a good idea that everybody flies? You know, the carbon footprint of air traffic is very high, obviously, right? So, so we're running above these, the replaceable volume of ecological resources, to put it very simply. Something I think we know, but when you see the figure... Now, when you look at the growing population growth over the last half century or something, you see a number of things, including the incredible increase in that population. So as recently as 1961, okay, the global population was just a little over 3 billion. Okay? And the idea of the total Earth, you've probably heard this concept, how many Earths do we need to sustain 
our current lifestyle. All right. So in 1961, we were fine. We only needed about, you know, we we we, we had plenty of surplus. Okay, and. Consumption levels were not destructive of the total ecological stock of resources. Okay, there was surplus, but already by within a decade, the population had risen to 3.7 million, but the the total consumption levels had increased even more. We'd reached the point of equilibrium. Okay, essentially one. Okay. By 1990, okay, within two more decades, the population had risen to 5.3 billion, and we needed a little over another quarter of an Earth to sustain our lifestyle. All right, we reached one point, nearly 1.3 Earths. Right. By 2014, the population had reached over seven billion. You notice the incredible rate of increase here, and we need. We're approaching the point of needing two Earths, but we only have one, right? Unless again, you're into some science fiction solution here of flying off to some. I don't think anybody's discovered a habitable planet yet, have they? They talk sometimes. They've spotted ones that look possible. They're roughly Earth size, but this is. Has anybody seen the movie called Avatar? Avatar. If not, try to find it. It's a really quite nice movie. It's about basically Earth people who've totally wrecked this planet have found another habitable planet, which is inhabited by a very gentle forest-living people. They're all blue. They're blue, right? In the movie, they're green or they're blue. They're blue. I think they're blue, right? Anyway, the natives are all blue. They don't look quite like us, but you know. They're not that alien, and the movie is about the way in which humans, having discovered that this planet has resources, of course, having wrecked this one, are moving on to another planet where they're going to do the same thing. And the movie is about resistance to this visually very beautiful movie. The the graphics and so on are incredibly sophisticated. You know, the sight of this landscape of this other rather Earth-like planet, but also a little different. So it's a, it's about basically the idea that you know if we wreck this Earth, never mind. Maybe we can find another planet. We can go and we can go there, and I guess we do the same thing, right? So I don't know how many planets you need before you finally run out of universe. You know, this doesn't work, obviously, right? As far as we know, we only have this one, and we're already using up its resources at a level far beyond replenishment rate. Okay. If we add to that certain things we already talked about, remember how much how much of the global food supply is wasted? Do you remember we talked about this one or two classes ago? Less half, exactly fifty percent, right? Exactly, yeah. Lost in post-harvest bad storage, in transportation, in other forms of waste, it's just not eaten. It's just never never consumed. So supermarkets actually throw away.、Uh, I had a student at the UNU who worked for、uh, a Japanese NGO called Second Harvest. I don't know if it exists here. Probably in Osaka or somewhere you'd find it. Second Harvest. What they did was they collected food from supermarkets that had reached the sell-by date, and they distributed it to homeless people. Okay, and it turned out that it was cheaper. It was simpler for the supermarket simply to give away the food than it was to destroy it. Because if you destroy the food, use even more energy, and a lot of food is packaged in plastic or wrapping or something, then you have the problem of the disposal of the containers as well as the content. So the supermarket is quite happy to give the food to the NGO. They don't mind you take it, give it away. All right. So if you went to one of the big parks like Ueno Park in Tokyo, sometimes on the, the particular days, the second harvest truck would show up and they'd have all this food. Remember one of the homeless people saying, "Though, of course, you never knew what you were going to get. One day it might be all something, and one day it's all cup noodles. The next day it's all onigiri. The next day it's all something else, right? But at least you were getting something, yeah. And it was actually more efficient to give it away than to destroy it. So when you add the destruction to this,、uh, you're looking at a very strange situation indeed, where we are using up resources." 
And if you look at national comparisons, sorry guys, but Japan not doing very well. Okay. The United Arab Emirates, the little countries in the Gulf, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and so on, right? Actually are the worst. Have you ever been there? It's quite surreal. It's a bit like being on another planet, actually. You fly into a place like Dubai, it has a huge airport, which is this huge shopping center. You can get lost in the airport, right? Uh, hundreds and hundreds of shops, cafes, and all this kind of stuff. It's in the middle of a desert, right? Literally, it's in the middle of the desert. It's on the edge of Arabia, right? Abu Dhabi, any of these places, Bahrain, you know. Once upon a time, they were just stopovers for flight site between Southeast Asia and Europe would stop at Bahrain to refuel, nothing. Now, incredible number of high-rise buildings. I think one of those countries has the world's tallest hotel. You may have seen pictures of it. It's an incredibly tall hotel, and outside there's a marina, which is shaped like uh, flower petals, where all the super rich can keep their yachts. Where do they get their energy from? It's in the desert, right? With lots of high-rise buildings, water, electricity, <laughs> waste disposal. The answer is that, for example, a lot of the water comes from desalination. They're pumping water out of the Persian Gulf and converting it with the use of energy, obviously, into fresh water, okay? So the United Arab Emirates are basically a disaster area ecologically, okay? They're, they're, they are a huge deficit, and they require large quantities of energy, or a rather, what would you call it, artificial economy? People from India often go there on like shopping trips and so on. It's the hub from the big airline called Emirates, which is one of the world's biggest airlines. And one of the nice things about Emirates, the service is very good, I must admit, is they go everywhere. You want to go to quite small cities in other parts of the world, Emirates probably has a flight, but you have to go to Dubai. You know, you fly from here to Dubai, then you fly from Dubai to Manchester or to Berlin or to, you know, some smaller city. It doesn't have an, a major international airport. They go there. So a huge airline, but, but the whole economy is based on stuff passing through, okay? The US is pretty bad. Uh, but then so are Japan and the UK. They're both running at ecological deficits, all right? Um, there are countries which do not, that have a positive footprint, that are above, above the, you know, the acceptable level, including Sweden, Argentina, Finland, Australia, Canada. Canada, right next door to the US, has an ecological footprint far lower than the, the, its neighbor to the south. That has a lot, there are a lot of reasons for that, not only the, the weather and so on, they have quite a lot of, they have plenty of water, they have all sorts of stuff, okay. The Scandinavian countries do very well. In fact, actually, you see Argentina has a fairly big country with fairly small population and not much industry. Uh, the major industry in Argentina actually is the beef cattle. You, they have real cowboys if you go to Argentina, gauchos. You go out onto the plains outside Buenos Aires, huge, huge prairies, and millions of cows. So, you know, beef for your hamburger, leather for shoes and whatever is coming from there. But so Japan not doing too well here, right, is, is running at a deficit, okay? And if you look around, you can probably see why. Energy use is extremely intensive, right? Uh, packaging, it's a small thing, but I, I mean, I already have, I've only been here like three weeks and I already have a whole cupboard full of plastic bags. I can't get rid of them. Every time I buy anything, I get another plastic bag. Except some supermarkets now, you can bring your own bag. You get five yen off or something, or you have to buy the bag, right? But um, it's not doing too, too well, okay? And it's not really a population issue, right? The population is actually declining. But it's a high energy use, high consumption, very, very high consumption level society, okay? Which is great in many ways, you live here, but has, has consequences, all right, for long-term sustainability. Um, 
You could look at other things too that you could put into this model if we're trying to build a total model. And one thing also that's missing from the ecological footprint model is uh, food sustainability. Okay, what percentage of, ja of food in Japan is imported from somewhere else? Is it high, low figure, or very low figure? 90%, uh, 70%. It's quite high. It's quite high. You could test this easily by simply going to a supermarket and looking looking at the origin of a lot of, of a lot of products, right? I can't give you the exact figure at the moment, and it's changed since I last looked it up. But it's 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 a it's a it's a net importer of food. It's a net importer of oil. Obviously, there's no oil here, right? So energy and very high percentage of food are coming in from the outside which is fine as long as the international trade system is working properly, as long as you can afford shipping of food products from other places, which you can then consume here, right? Uh, if those conditions change, then Japan would actually be quite vulnerable both to energy and food crisis, okay? Because it's not currently sustainable in either of those major dimensions, okay? so. If you look at nations like this, it's kind of quite interesting. So, how are we doing for time? A few more minutes, okay, let's get things. Um, we'll start looking at concrete examples of alternative solutions to proposed solutions to sustainability next, next time. But here, a few factors we should bear in mind as we trans, the transition to that subject, okay. Um, Japan is not too bad in, well, not too bad, but not too good either in respect of national policies, oddly enough, despite the danger of natural disasters here, volcanic. After the Fukushima disaster, all, power, all nuclear power stations were stopped, right? Slowly they were reopened one by one after some controversy about the dangers of this. And one of the, it turned out that when geologic mapping was done after, long after they'd been built, at least two power stations, nuclear power stations in Japan, turned out to be built on active fault lines, which is not a good idea to build your nuclear power station on an active earthquake prone location. All right, you could probably find safer places. But oddly enough, nobody had done that before construction. It occurred to you probably, wouldn't you do that before you started building your nuclear power station? It was only because there'd been a crisis that people started to do serious geological mapping of the, you know, of the geology of areas in which vulnerable um, industries were located. And this could be true, by the way, not, not only of things like um, uh, uh, nuclear plants, but things like oil refineries. In fact, after the Fukushima plant in Kashima, which is just down the coast between Chiba and, and Fukushima, um, at least one of the oil refineries there at Kashima was burning. It was so badly damaged in the earthquake that it, uh, there were serious fires. Okay. So we don't have to go through all these things. I just wanted to draw your attention to several levels of, of mitigation. How do you begin to address those problems? Well. Nationally, you can do all sorts of things. You can have strict legal frameworks for building standards, for example. The quality of building has to meet certain, at least minimum standards. And you know, permission can be refused if you want to build in a dangerous area, for example, thought to be vulnerable to natural disaster, for example. You know, effective administration. Now, when the when the Kobe earthquake occurred, one of the one of the things I think we mentioned this before that did not happen immediately was the army was not mobilized, and it turned out it took two or three days for the army to be actively engaged in research, you know, in rescue operations and fire, uh, you know, putting out fires and stuff like this because it turned out that the Ministry of Defense was not connected to the Ministry of something else. So you know, one ministry couldn't really communicate with other ministries. They had to go through some complicated thing to. This happens a lot in Japan with bureaucratic agencies. Yeah, when I worked for the UN, I used to do projects sometimes with an organization called FACID, Foundation for Advanced Studies in International Development. It's located in Tokyo. What was FACID for? FACID was to link the foreign ministry 
okay, with other ministries. For example, the foreign ministry was responsible for aid, okay, but other ministries were responsible for things like obviously health and so on. So if, if the Ministry of Foreign Affairs wanted to link itself, its activities to things that related to development projects, they couldn't do it directly. They had no bureaucratic means. So there was a, a new organization in the middle to mediate between ministries. Think, this is weird. So you have three ministries, you have three organizations now. You have like two ministries and you have one in between so they can talk to each other. Right? You'd have thought it'd be quite simple after an earthquake for the ministry of somebody to pick up the phone and say, we need the army. Right? And the army could be mobilized immediately in emergency response. In the Kobe case, it took about two or three days before that happened because of the bureaucratic structures did not enable inter-ministry communication fast enough to respond. Say something wrong there. You need to work out your bureaucratic structure in such a way that your administrative framework is flexible. Okay, so this would be a matter of you know, having effective emergency services. Um, and there's an interesting example of that. I, I have a I have some friends who who run uh, an NGO in India, a city called Lucknow, and. They've been in Japan a number of times and they were doing all sorts of things. One point they were here, they were, they were, they came, they come to Japan particularly because they wanted to raise money for uh, a fire engine and an ambulance. Okay. And the reason they were interested in Japan was they needed small one. Okay. If you look at the typical fire tender in Europe, they're big, they're big trucks, but they don't fit down little, little lanes, right? So a fire engine or an ambulance that can, it can, it cannot reach a, a fire, for example, is pretty useless, right? So they come to Japan because they, you, they knew the technology was here. You do sometimes see very small fire tenders, have you noticed? They're designed to fit down little streets, the back streets of Kyoto or somewhere, where a major fire tender probably couldn't reach, okay? So it's quite simple things like that. Don't build your trucks too big to reach the place where they might be needed in an emergency. You thought it was very obvious, right? But it's apparently not. Quite simple things, right? At the national city level, we were saying things like land use control, maintaining waterways, exactly what did not happen in Chennai and Mumbai with disastrous floods because of the non-maintenance of, of drains and canals and waterways trash being thrown into them and allowing people to build in areas that had formerly been areas where rainwater was absorbed much more efficiently, okay? Neighborhood levels and including something we'll talk about more later is strengthening local communities because local communities and civil society, NGOs for example, so-called third sector organizations, often have the knowledge to respond at a local level, which a national organization may not have. People know each other. People know who lives where, right? People have networks of mutual support. People have all those kinds of things. If those are enhanced, you have very effective local level responses. And I think this is the last one. As we move on then to talk about alternatives or responses to this, we, we might bear in mind several levels. There's, there's the ones we just talked about. There are both national, regional, local kind of response levels where it's appropriate, okay? Um, and when we break that down, I think we find there are at least four major factors that we're gonna draw out when we look at examples. One of those is obviously environmental. Sustainability in terms of both maintaining a satisfactory environment for the future and not damaging an environment in the present, which leads to things like flooding, because we said earlier, you've built on a floodplain, which is not a good idea because uh, it's gonna flood, all right? So both the positive and negative aspects of thinking about environment, what should you do to sustain the environment? What should you avoid both not to damage it and not to create a risk factor, which was quite avoidable if you looked at the geology, the shape of the place, the water flow, um, you know, the runoff of flood water, and things like this, you could have saved yourself 
a lot of trouble. The second big factor, I think, is the social one, is the importance of community networks. And if you're thinking about future responses, in fact, how to strengthen those community networks, okay? In such a way that, that uh, in the event of a disaster, for example, people, people know each other, people can share resources, people know who's missing, people know all sorts of things like this, okay? Which at a higher level, as it were, bureaucratic or national level, people have no idea what is happening at the, at the local level. Um, there's a famous saying, well, a famous saying if you look at the architecture of this, earthquakes don't kill people, buildings kill people. Meaning, of course, that unsafe construction standards are the cause of, of injury and death, not the earthquake itself. I mean, if you're in an open space or if you're in a very resilient building, you know, experiencing an earthquake is not nice, but it may not actually be extremely dangerous. Okay? If you're in an unsafe building, of course, the probability is the building itself is going to be the cause of fatalities and injuries. So this is where the architectural issue comes in, building safe structures, okay? And the evidence is that in very, very many cases, uh, many, many lives could have been saved in the event of major earthquakes simply because the building standards were high enough to withstand. It's impossible to plan perfectly, obviously. Uh, there was a very celebrated case in Niigata about 20 years ago where there was an earthquake in Niigata. And there were apparently two bridges. I have never been to Niigata. Anybody from Niigata? There were two bridges apparently across the river. There was an old one which dates really back to Meiji period and very solid, you know, chunky kind of stone building. And there was the new one which was built with the latest principles of da -da -da, engineering and so on. Okay. After the earthquake, which one was badly damaged? New one. <laughs> it, was, it was the new one. <laughs> the new one, right? But this is supposed to be the higher standards of earthquake proofing and so on. So, I mean, it's true. You can, you can do your best without obviously having 100% assurance that a structure, for example, would withstand, depending on the nature of the quake, its closeness, its depth, uh, and those kind of factors, obviously. But nevertheless, you know, we have a lot of knowledge now about what can be done to at least mitigate the dangers of, um, in that case, the earthquake. If you ever go to the very beautiful city of Venice in Europe, if you ever go to Italy, you should go to Venice. It's a magical city because it's built on water, right? You'll notice that almost all the houses, nobody lives on the ground floor, okay? And the reason is that generally speaking, you get floods in the winter. You go in the summer, the water level is fairly low, but once you get winter rains and so on, high tides, the, 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 the uh, lower levels flood. So houses are built with a basement. Not a basement, it's not below ground, it's above ground, but it's designed to be, if nothing's happening, you can use it as a space for storage or keep your bicycle there or do whatever you like, okay? But in the event of flooding, which is common, your structure is designed to be effectively waterproofed. You're living above water level, okay? And actually, a very interesting style, therefore, but, you know, long experience, obviously, of flooding. And if you build a city on water, you have to expect high tides sometimes, unusually high tides, what are called spring tides, where the tides are higher than normal levels, okay? combination of rain and high tide and this kind of stuff is going to flood your place. So build your structure to adapt. Quite simple. The Venetians have been doing this for centuries, of course, right? Okay. Um, even a small thing, uh, one of my brothers lives in South Wales and I, I emailed him a couple of days ago because I saw the news, this bad flooding in in, in the very area where he lives, so close to where he lives. He said, are you guys okay, right? He said, yes, fine. He said, in fact, they were okay. He said, there were, there were two things they thought about, or one I'd never thought about. He said, first of all, live on an elevated place, 
not right by the river, so they were well above, well above the closest river. Okay, so safe from the flooding which occurred in the lower parts of the town. And secondly, their house was built on limestone. What's good about limestone? I mean, I never, would never think about the geo what's under my house, right? But limestone is highly absorbent of water because it's not like solid rock like granite, for example, which is, which is very, very dense, okay? It contains cracks and, and waterways and this kind of stuff. So in fact, if you go to limestone areas where there's a lot of limestone, and if there are any places like this in Japan, you'll find caves. So if you like caving, or you like to visit caves, it's usually in a limestone area because the water that over long periods of time will have created caves. So you say, no, it's great to live on limestone because you know, the heavy rain, well, most of it will disperse into the rocks underneath your house, okay? I'm sorry, I never thought of that. Build your house on limestone, it's much safer geologically than building on you know, some sort of non-absorbent <laughs> rock base that's underneath, underneath your place, right? I'm sorry, I never thought of that myself, right? Okay, but then this might have to do with the cultural factor we mentioned, collective memory, um, remembering previous disasters and knowing what you shouldn't do, where you should not build, you know, where you should not try to construct something because you knew in the past there'd been serious problems with that particular location, all right? Strong local culture relating to the community networks. And this thing we talked about before, <coughs> maybe we'll talk about more detail later on. If there's some particular issue you'd like to discuss more, just tell me, we can expand it, right? Was this strong religious base where people had both explanations, as it were, for what was happening and had networks built through their religious institutions of mutual support, feeding each other, doing all sorts of things like this, for example. Um, if you ever need a free lunch and you're in India, okay, um, in not far from Delhi, the, the state north of Delhi is called Punjab, and the, the people who live in the Punjab are known as Sikh, S-I-K-H. The men typically wear a turban. Okay, many other parts of India, people often wear turbans. Sikh men generally wear a turban because they're not supposed to cut their hair. It's one of the traditions of their religion. One of, one of the traditions of the Sikh religion is that if you go to a Sikh temple, a Gurdwara, and say at lunchtime, they will feed anybody who shows up. You don't have to be Sikh. You don't have to be Indian. You don't have to be anybody. They have a long standing religious tradition of feeding anybody who's hungry. So the temple will have a big kitchen, right? Because the kitchen is used to produce food. And so, you know, homeless people, people, travelers, you know, pilgrims, anybody can go there and can actually have, uh, you know, it's simple vegetarian food, but it's really nice. It fills you up, okay? So in the Sikh religion, there is a strong tradition of mutual assistance, both for other Sikhs I guess would we'll probably have some priority, but in principle for anybody else, okay? Anybody else who's hungry, show up and you can, you can be fed, okay? Uh, so you will find in many religious traditions some example of this kind of charity work or created NGOs of one kind or another, some kind of community organizations, there's things like this, which predispose them to be able to act effectively in the case of a disaster in their area because they have an infrastructure. And the infrastructure may be more efficient than the bureaucratic one precisely because it isn't bureaucratic. People can respond quickly because of their community ties without having to go through some kind of government agency or something to get permission to do stuff and all this kind of thing. Bureaucrats can get in the way quite often of um, response. Sometimes for very interesting, I, I just give you one final example for today. In, in the western parts of India, one of the, state, one of the states in western India is called Rajasthan. It's arid and semi-arid area, but actually, actually a desert. It also has some of the most beautiful architecture in India. The palaces and castles you find in Rajasthan are really gorgeous, okay? Um, 
But according to some rule which goes back to I don't know where, all water resources are owned by the government. And this causes all sorts of local level problems. For example, um, because it's an arid area, people have started well, over several generations now, all sorts of clever ways of water harvesting. Sometimes these are very simple. If you know that water tends to run down a particular hillside during the monsoon, you build just little check dams. They don't have to be very high. They can just be like two or three feet high. So that the water running down is either collected or it percolates into the groundwater. It's not lost. It doesn't just flow out into the desert somewhere and it doesn't evaporate so quickly. You can, you can, you can have simple ways of capture. Technically, in Rajasthan, that's illegal without asking the government. And if you ask them, they'll probably say, well, go ahead. You know, that's fine. If you, your villagers want to put in the labor to build dams, go ahead. Right. But they can also obstruct, of course, because since they officially control water, you really have to ask them before you can do something. So, you know, if my village is liable to be flooded, I think we would just do something naturally, spontaneously from within the village. In some cases you can't without having to go to the bureaucracy, right? It's where bureaucracy gets in the way. Often with religious institutions, it works the other way around because they have a local network, temples, churches, shrines, whatever, that can respond. There's absolutely no need to go through any kind of political level to get permission or responses to whatever your current crisis is. So that, I think, is an issue will come up quite a lot, important part of cultural response. OK, so questions, comments about today's? Say, so do look this up. I love the, the, these things are easily Googleable. That's a new word in the language now, right? Let's Google it, right? <laughs> All the footprint thing. Now, one little piece that we, we, we only have one class next week because I gather entrance exams are on next week, right? So you're all survivors of that horror, right? So <laughs> you can, so Thursday is our class. But one of the examples I like to do a little homework on, okay, with alternatives. And again, just Google it, you'll find it immediately. Do a little homework of your own. It's the transition movement. Just Google it, you'll find it. All their stuff is out there, open source. Well, as an example, we'll, we'll start with, because it's, it's been a very interesting, well-documented, and efficient one. So, uh, we mentioned it once before, if you remember. It started in the west of England, a small town, where a local activist and his friends got together with this idea that they should start to think about transition to a sustainable future before that future arrives, right? And came up with a very, very interesting model of how, as we were saying last time, you know, how to get from here to there. How do you reach that? There are many other examples, but let's start with this one. So do a little research. You have, you have almost a week, you have a week actually to think about this. Please look it up and then we can discuss it and see what its advantages and disadvantages are and whether in fact it's a model or say towns or cities in Japan, for instance, also to work towards local sustainability. It's become very, very popular in Europe and other parts of the world, parts of the United States. Towns now identify themselves as transition towns. You know, the town itself has adopted actively the policy of working towards sustainability, becoming a zero carbon community by some date they've defined. Okay, and we saw the figures. Japan's still a little way from that. Okay, so this might be a useful model. Okay. Kote, yes. yes. Um, as you mentioned before, uh, if the language disappear, yes. then the culture may be disappearing. Uh -huh. uh, yes. So uh, in the last year, it's very really well known that Hong Kong has the parade. Yes, yes, so, yes. Yeah. Do you think there may be a culture reason that? The Hong Kong, the people in Hong Kong, they were fear that their culture will be disappear. Yeah, to some extent. I mean, I think the Hong Kong case is is complicated, of course, because it's linked. 
you know, Hong Kong is now part of China, <laughs> right? But in, in, in practic practical terms, if you go to Hong Kong now, it, it looks like it did during the British period. You know, there's not that much sign. It, it's the, the whole social system economy has been left more or less as it was. I think the fear of many Hong Kong people is they will in a sense become absorbed into the, the culture and political structures of mainland China and they will lose certain democratic rights and this kind of stuff. So yeah, I think they do see themselves as having a very distinct culture. It's grown up over that period of colonialism and so on before it, it was you know, formerly part of, part of the People's Republic. You know, it, it had a rather distinctive history to it. And that still shows up, I think, if you go there in the way in which people behave, talk, the use of English is much broader than it is in other parts of China, probably, and so on. So yeah, I mean, I don't know that Hong Kongers think of it, in, particularly think of it in sustainability terms. I think they're thinking more in terms of freedoms and political rights, and they fear that that will be eroded. And their, what do you call it? Their rather special status. You know, you can travel in and out of Hong Kong. Again, Hong Kong, in a way, is a bit like Dubai. It's also the hub of a major Asian airline, Cathay Pacific airline, right? So although Cathay Pacific is not a Chinese airline, it nevertheless operates from Hong Kong. Hong Kong is its, 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 its hub, OK? So it still, it still has that, you know, that rather distinctive quality, I think. And I think people are probably afraid of seeing that eroded and of losing their yeah, their distinctiveness, which they don't, clearly don't want, judging by the problems in the last, how many months? Three months? Four months? Riots, trouble, excitement in Hong Kong over at least three months now, right? Three, at least three, more, probably more than that now, right? I think for that reason. So Hong Kong would have a sustainability problem too, but we won't get into, into that being a little a, a peninsula and an island, basically, right? Joined to the mainland but uh, also with a dense, very, very dense urbanization. Probably in urban terms, Hong Kong is one of the most densely populated people, popular place in the world. I can't tell you offhand, you could Google it, how many people per square kilometer in Hong Kong, particularly in the very urban areas, is very, very high, very, very high. And of course they need water, food, and what, the issues of waste and energy like anywhere else. Okay, thank you then. So see you on, I think it's Thursday next week, right? Thursday, Thursday, I have my diary here. I, I think it's Thursday after the ex entrance exams are, are through. So do a little homework, all right? See what you can find out about the transition movement and whether it would work here in the local environment. Okay. Thank you.